Okay, thanks, Peter. I, I should get Neville to translate. I'd be a pigeon speaker, wouldn't you, Doc? Yeah, Sorry, perfectly, but I know it's a terrific book. Yeah, it, it basically, uh, it's, it's a quote. It's a paraphrase of several quotes, actually, from farmers that we received whilst doing this project. It basically means you talk about um, me planting kai kai food, uh, but where is the market? There are no markets, apart from their local markets. So um, this is a study, uh, in, essentially it's a study of the Papua New Guinea uh, fresh produce system. Um, and the whole point of it, as you'll see in a moment, was, was to work out whether or not it was feasible to uh, build and operate a central wholesale market in Port Moresby, the capital. It was funded by New Zealand Aid. It was a very short uh, um, project that uh, we had to get underway very quickly and finish very quickly. Uh, mainly we had to start early because of the elections. It had to finish early because it had to be uh, literally a month early because um, the Minister wanted to take the results to the South Pacific Forum. I um, don't know what he did with them there because I never heard anything. But um, fundamentally, this is a I'm trying to convey to you and will hopefully over the next 12 months or so with a few presentations about our work, uh, try and convey to you what, what it is that the Value Chain Program does. Uh, as well as that, I, I, I suppose in the back of my mind, I also want to convey to you a little bit of understanding about this country that is right on the doorstep of Australia and is strategically so important to our future. Uh, just a, oh, I'm going to move through quite a few slides to set context very quickly. This is showing you just how many roads there are in the country. There are roads up here, which is generally known as the Highlands Highway, and there's the only other um, seal road system is here at Port Moresby down to Cloudy Bay. So very few roads in Port Moresby apart from the uh, uh, secondary and tertiary roads. The context, population is about 7 million, 6.9, 85% rural, 60% plus unemployed. Adult literacy rates for both sexes uh, is about 60%. The UN Human Development Index places it 153 out of 187 countries, which puts it around the, the area of Bangladesh, uh, Zimbabwe uh, and some of the Central African countries. It's expected years of schooling, about 5.8. The gross national in, uh, income per capita is about 1,300 US dollars. The GDP growth is at 8%. And 35% uh, nearly 36% of the population earn less than $1.25 a day. So in other words, less than about $400 a year. So uh, it's, it's a very poor country. And 7.2% of the GDP comes from aid. You can see this gentleman here, this is the main market, the largest market in Port Moresby, the capital. And look at this in the background. Uh, and this is one of eight markets in Port Moresby. And this is the state of the way it's run. We'll hear more about that later. Security is a major issue for everybody. This is what greeted us when we started uh, the uh, uh, project that Colin Birch is running uh, in 2009. Uh, we woke up next morning to, and had during the night, a riot of about 6,000 people burning and looting Chinese stores. So at that particular point in time, the Chinese weren't too popular in New Guinea. This is from Wabag up in the, the highlands, and it's basically saying, Lucy can go and hold and shovel. In other words, uh, they're trying to encourage people to put down their guns and, and go gardening with their shovels. Uh, this is an expat house, the back of an expat house, expatriate white person's house in Port Moresby. I'm showing you this because you'll see more razor wire in, uh, in, in New Guinea than you've ever seen in your life. And normally there were actually guards just out of the picture. And this, this point at the back of a house where people come out of their house, get into their car, is the point of kidnapping and hold-ups. There are four, on average, four kidnappings of whites per week in, uh, in Port Moresby. And every weekend uh, on the golf course is an average of two armed holders. So it gives you an idea about the place. There's no, in, no national road system. In fact, this is a national highway heading up to Wabag, coming down here towards uh, Garo or past Garoka to Lai. 
um, the um, another washout there on the on the main highway, uh, and uh, this is a boulder field. You don't really get the feeling of it there, but that truck was stuck because the boulders were about <coughs> the size of these seats, and the wheels were spinning in between the boulders. Thirty-five percent live ten kilometres or more from a road. This is a Tapiti where in uh, Colin Birch's project we're running some uh, trials down here. This is sort of just on the way up to Tapini. It's a six hour nightmare drive of about 240 kilometres. Uh, that's what happens to your car. These are some of the things that you have to get over. Uh, but there are wonderful, hard working people. Give you an idea of the value of that bunch of bananas. Two kina is about uh, a, a dollar, roughly a dollar. Australian dollar. Here's a, a lady sitting in the midst of the Gordon's Market again. These women are carrying water up to about a half a hectare of uh, bok choy and they're carrying up out of an incised river system where it's incised about six metres into the river and they have to carry two watering cans up and water this half a hectare of, of bok choy. So PNG is experiencing a resources boom, which is massive, even by Australian standards. Just look at some of these numbers. 70 tonnes of silver, 60 tonnes of, uh, of gold, etc. Um, this ExxonMobil gas pipeline, I took more about at the moment, it's a $15 billion construction exercise, and there's more in the, in the, in the pipeline. This is Porgram Mine, just giving you an idea of the sort of scale of some of these things. A map to show you you know, where all these potential mines and mines are. Uh, the range of them from, this, these are oil and gas projects, there's a lot of oil and gas in the country as well. This is the Exxon project where they've got a 700 kilometre pipeline down to uh, Port Moresby or near Port Moresby to export gas. The resource sector is driving a massive development boom. This is looking out from um, the main town centre across to the slums of uh, 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 Hanawabada and uh, Komidobu. Uh, this is a massive, on the other hand, this is a massive uh, uh, retail supermarket development that's going on, a lot of it funded by the, uh, by the boom. A lot of Chinese money in New Guinea at the moment, um, probably uh, just massive inflows of, of money. Is one of our project team. The aims of the project, the overarching goal is the increased economic activity in uh, domestic perishable fresh produce. They wanted to improve the availability and uh, the marketing opportunities for farmers. And so it was a feasibility study which had to be done in the context of the whole supply system because as we'll see in a moment uh, the Port Moresby and the, the country around it, the province around it can't, can't feed itself. Methodology, there's our little team there talking to the manager of uh, Bismarck uh, Freight Lines in Lay. Uh, convergent, divergent interview, it's a, it's a phenomenological uh, uh, type of methodology um, basically around convergent interviewing we interviewed over 90 people and groups, uh, did two surveys and used the typical qualitative approach of, of scepticism, triangulation and validation uh, of our results. Thematic analysis and then peer review. And these are not the only methods we use in value chain analysis. In fact, it's a very open framework where we can plug in economic analysis, uh, carbon footprinting, a whole range of other methods can get can get plugged into, into value chain analysis. Again, looking across over the port to uh, Hanalbada, background of food security. I just want to talk about this for a moment. The economy is strong. I, uh, I interviewed a lot of the, the big end of town, the big corporates and the big businesses. They said the place, the banks told them, this is a quote from the Westpac uh, Southwest Pacific uh, CEO. He said the place is awash with money. He said I've got the poorest loan portfolio in uh, in uh, the Westpac Group because uh, everybody's got so much cash. Uh, <coughs> the wholesale market that I was talking about or studying the feasibility for was about 35 million keener investment, and um, uh, the potential partners or the potential investors could fund it out of cash flow. It's that rich. 
35 million keynes, so in other words, about 17 or 18 million uh, dollars. They'd fund it out of cash flow. 20 year population growth rate is 3.6%. Uh, total demand uh, for fresh vegetables in, New in Port Moresby is 168,000 tonnes per annum, and 59% of that is informal. In other words, it comes from buying off your neighbour, buying from a local roadside uh, vendor. Uh, and uh, is, uh, or, or growing your own, of course. Liquid natural gas, natural gas peaked uh, at about, uh, its, its demand for food peaked at about 6,760 tonnes per annum, but it's estimated to drop from 2014 to 100 tonnes. And, and this, you'll see in a moment, this was a huge opportunity for New Guinea uh, to, uh, to generate uh, cash flows for farmers. Other major resource projects coming on stream uh, will show that there's very strong uh, show that there's very strong demand for growth over the next 20 years. 80% of uh, the liquid natural gas projects food is imported, with an opportunity cost of 500,000 kina per week. Now, in the context of the average wages being $400 a week uh, a year, that's an enormous amount of money that's gone big. So, I want to talk about the context again in terms of the trends in the food system development around the world. There have been three waves of development uh, in retail uh, development around the world. Papua New Guinea and a few countries like it are on the fourth wave. And what I did in this project was to try and learn from the global literature as to what's happened with fresh food systems and fresh food marketing systems around the world in the previous three waves. And this is what I found out. First of all, there are these macro trends. There's a trend from large urban to small uh, supermarkets moving, uh, or shall I say modern retailing um, businesses moving from large urban centres to small regional centres. From the upper to middle class uh, and then to the working poor. Uh, move, move a trend from process, uh, towards processed food uh, semi-processed to fresh, oh, sorry I'll say that again. Uh, the trend is that modern retailing hits processed food first and the last to feel the in influence of, of modern retailing is fresh produce. Spot markets uh, with high supply risk and few standards morph into direct sourcing from preferred suppliers, so in other words supermarkets First of all, in the early stages of a, of a retail development um, in, a, in a country, they will go to spot markets, the local markets. Uh, and that's what they're doing largely in New Guinea. And then they'll start going to directly, directly to farmers, the bigger farmers, to cooperatives, and, uh, or they'll go to imports. And then, ultimately, they will move straight into centralised natural national distribution networks and they bypass smallholders. That means the vast majority of farmers in a rural country like New Guinea will be left behind. They'll be left in poverty. That's the supermarket revolution. It goes from uncoordinated spot markets to aggregation for direct supply to supermarkets through properties and the like, exclusion of smallholders and then centralised national networks with regional distribution centres. What happens in terms of, of uh, wholesale markets is that um, it's the same process except that um, uh, farmers and coordinated groups supply a wholesale market and, and supermarkets will tend to buy from those wholesale markets for a while. In Africa they did it for about 20 years. And then they started to go <coughs> direct to reduce complexity costs and risks, which is the fundamental retail supply problem. This is the challenge in this country, in every country in the world where supermarkets develop, is to reduce complexity, costs and risks. And that eventually excludes smallholders. And what I, in some countries though, in particular Vietnam is one shining example where there are a number of very good uh, uh, examples of this. The trend, the development trend goes uh, 
to wholesale markets, direct supply, but then wholesale markets evolve into hubs and parks which supply the supermarkets. And that ends up including small holders. So this is the challenge, this, to, to go to a wholesale market evolution type of uh, uh, situation rather than allowing the supermarkets to exclude smallholders. The choices of managers for governing relationships, and fundamentally this is retail managers in supermarkets drive the supply chains. And the choices that they have in um, the relationships in their value chain for governance, in other words, and if you look at this, these, each of these columns is a, a continuum from spot cash market to vertical integration. Vertical integration is an attempt to control your supply chain by including it in your company. Um, a relationship-based alliance is one where uh, you have long-term relationships and there is so much commitment and trust between you that you act, the whole chain acts as though it was one company, but they are still independent businesses. And the trend is from spot markets, down here at the bottom, the trend is from spot markets to relationship-based alliances, wherever you go around the world. Uh, in Tasmania, for instance, we, we have a lot of specifications contracts with um, uh, Simplot and with Port Farm Produce and, and others like that. So the trend even here is this way, towards the right-hand side. The existing chain in New Guinea uh, <clears throat> is just about any permutation of arrangements that you can think of to overcome the sort of problems that I showed you in the slides early on. And I won't go through the details of it, but there's basically two sources of cool temperate, or two, two pathways for cool temperate vegetables out of the highlands. One is by air transport, and the other one by road and sea transport. That takes um, uh, basically a day to get to, uh, to Port Moresby, uh, and costs you about um, three, three keen or 50, uh, per kilogram, and that one takes about anywhere between 10 and 40 days to get to Port Moresby, and costs you about, well, probably less than a Kenya, so half a dollar. This is typical of road transport, shoved in the back of a truck with passengers on top, paying passengers. They arrive at markets where there's a lot of conflict and potential uh, aggravation and uh, they're very aggressive opportunistic places these markets I'll talk, talk more about those there's uh, some farmers at uh, Lay Port uh, their, their produce, their cabbages were brought down from the highlands in a truck and dumped at the gate of the shipping company in the 40 degree sun and there they'll sit till they get packed into a container like that and I can see the food science people nodding as to what that would do in a container at 40 degrees, sitting on a ship for 10, a minimum of 10 days to get to, or in port or in the ship, to get to Port Moresby. Um, you can imagine what it would be like. There are refrigerated containers, but um, they're too valuable. They cost between $30,000 and $90,000 a piece. And they're too valuable to send up those rows that I showed you earlier in the, in the slides. And then they go on a ship um, with, uh, takes about two to two and a half days when they eventually get on the ship to get to Port Moresby. But this is the sort of produce that you see there. This is the lay market. Just beautiful produce, wherever you look. If only they could get it through the logistical system to Port Moresby. A lot of detail here, don't want you to look at that. This is the best practice model we developed for the uh, Coal Merch project, which is separate to this one. Um, and but it was basically about the same problems. It's trying. To, it's basically trying to get smallholders to cooperate together, to work together in their production, to bring all their produce to one point, so that you get critical mass, you get scale. Then you get independent transport, commercial freight service, not sticking sticking in the back of a uh, truck, which has then um, got passengers standing on top of it for six hours while it goes to market. Imagine what your vegetables would be like after six hours of that on the sort of roads that I just showed you. And then um, 
direct supply to the buying outlets and uh, consumer segmentation. That's the model that we're trying to get up in uh, the other project. I want to talk about very briefly about smallholder characteristics, just so you understand what they like. This lady's planting ginger. Um, number of gardens, they have about four or five gardens, or three to five gardens uh, each family. They grow about four to five different types of vegetables. They supply about four different outlets. They earn, you can see, um, the off-farm income is, is higher in Mount Hagen up in the Highlands, less so in Broker, which is also in the Highlands. Central province is around Port Moresby. So the off-farm income opportunities are much lower around Port Moresby for some reason. The gross family income is higher up in the Highlands. Well, certainly is up at Hagen anyway. Um, so that's about $5,000. And that's by comparison to the $400 average. So farmers are actually quite well off if they can get their act together. A little bit about Central Province farmers. A bit more about roads. Trucking companies don't like smallholder freight because they have lots of aggravation, lots of conflict over vegetables rotting in the, in the containers. 90% of the transport is by po uh, public motor vehicle, PMV, is just the back of a truck or a broken down old bus. Highlands Highway is in abysmal condition, that's not my words, but the public media reporter. Traffic is expected to double in the next two years. Some companies uh, are losing one to two container loads per month to hijacking and theft, valued at about 180000 a kilo or $90,000, say $100,000. Uh, and occasionally the hot the, even the trucks are destroyed. And that's about four hundred thousand kilo. Uh, sorry, four hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Um, and I mean, it's got so sophisticated that where the trucks are going very slow up the steep hills, gangs jump up onto the containers with basically a big can opener, and they jack open the top of the container and throw the goods out. Truck firms are reluctant to use reefers, that is, refrigerated containers, because they cost so much. You need three, ton of, <coughs> three times the containers required for the produce. So you have one for the produce, one coming back on the ship, <coughs> and one going down on the ship. So one's been loaded, one's on the ship, and one's coming back on the ship. So you need three containers for every container load that you need. Dedicated bed service will require, is required up in the highlands to get cool temperate vegetables to... Um, uh, to, to Port Moresby. Air transport's got problems because um, they only have small aircraft, short runways. Baroka doesn't have a dedicated freight service because the runway's too short. Transport issues, collection points. Remember I said one of the things that farmers need to do is bring everything into a collection point? Well, this is a, an A-built collection point and it's empty. It's been empty since 2008. So I did a survey to find out why. Out of 19 of them, here, 19 regional and district cool stores, only one was working. And these are the reasons why. Um, constructed, but not effective. Uh, they're uh, usually because of land tenure disputes between tribes. They've mistakenly built um, you know, a collection point on top of someone else's land, or inadequate contracts, like it was in this case. Uh, this guy here. Um, actually had the money to run the, the store, but after he got the contract, he went up to Port Moresby, had a big drinking spree, and came back with no money to operate. But there was nothing in the contract to uh, cancel the contract after that. This is, uh, again, Gordon's Market. Uh, this is a lowlander. So down around Port Moresby, there's a lot of discrimination and aggravation going on in the marketplace. So the Highlanders trade undercover the lowlanders get put out in the open. So the key supply chain problems are wastage, lack of regional wholesale facilities, lack of cool chain maintenance, lack of local collection, poor harvest and post-harvest practices, poor road system, lack of professional dedicated fresh produce freight, lack of port cool chain loading facilities. They just sit at the gate in 40 degrees. Poor congestion, poor management. Now, this is, these are numbers which actually came from one of the big retail supermarkets. You'll see here that the wastage on local uh, uh, produce is so much higher than on the imported 
that it actually has these effects on, on net margin. In other words, uh, you can get 30% margin on imported vegetables than you can on local vegetables simply because of the scale of wastage. So that's how important the wastage is. This is the Garanka Valley for Neville's um, memory. Relative capacity of the production areas. The highlands and the lowlands around Port Moresby are the two areas that uh, are the major vegetable sources of vegetables. The highlands are cool temperate. Uh, Hagen is, Mount Hagen is the most organised. Um, 85% of cow cow, that's sweet potato, is grown in the highlands and makes up 50% of the fresh produce sea freight. Central province is much less organised, much less entrepreneurial and skilled. There's a lot of the highlanders are very disparaging about the lowlanders because they think they're lazy and got no, no, uh, no entrepreneurial spirit. Central province currently grows 90% of the fresh produce and always will. There was a lot of concern about um, and a lot of discrimination by the central province people about the highlanders. They were saying, we don't want the highland produce down here. But look, it's only ever going to be a relatively small part of it. Central province, the, this is the bottom line, central province lacks the capacity to grow cool temperate vegetables and they need the highlanders. Now this is where the, the value in value chain projects of having integrated teams where we have biophysical scientists as well as social scientists in, in a value chain team. This is a quite sophisticated uh, area um, satellite mapping done by Richard Doyle and uh, others, uh, Matt, um, Matt Dell down in geography, of uh, some pretty sexy military data coming out of uh, satellites. And the yellow areas are the high fertility areas in Central Province. So there's Port Moresby, um, and these are the, the very few areas where there's high fertility. And it takes into account, I think I put it on the other, can't read it. <coughs> this takes into account slope, uh, aspects, rainfall, soils, stoniness, blah, blah, blah. So, we identified the, the high priority uh, vegetable growing areas uh, down, down the coast here from Moresby and up in the highlands, uh, or medium highlands just above Port Moresby and out here at Tepee, which I showed you earlier. The key pond marketing issues, uh, sorry, the key Port Moresby marketing issues are uncontrolled wholesaling at the retail markets. That is, anybody just comes in and sells their vegetables. You might grow them in the backyard. Localised competition, um, poor market information, misunderstanding, distrust and enmity in the chain relationships, negative incentives, misaligned incentives. For instance, the customs people on the ports, on the docks, uh, actually earn rents from the containers that sit on the docks. So there's no incentive for them to move the containers of vegetables through quickly. So they just leave them sitting there for three weeks and let them rot. So that's a negative incentive. Poorly managed retail facilities. And I, this is my, not me, this is a UN women's assessment. Extreme crime, rape, murder, drugs, trading with children, theft, everything you can imagine. Tribalised security, so the security guards are, show favouritism to their own tribe and to related tribes. Lack of access, inadequate physical structures, as you can see here. Siloed uh, national uh, capital district um, management of markets. The guy who managed these eight markets didn't know how much money they earned because it was in a separate department. He didn't know what contracts had been let because that was in a separate department. Just to give you an idea of projected consumption, did some pretty sophisticated uh, consumption modelling. Uh, 167,000 tonnes is, is, um, um, is the current um, consumption of vegetables in Port Moresby. Um, There's a logarithmic model which shows that in 20 years time they'll uh, nearly double that, that demand. <laughs> this shows you how important imports are, almost not important at all. Uh, the Highland Share Minister. What could it be? Minister. 
So people's concerns about the Highlands were really not all that valid. Sorry. You want to know how much money farmers can make from uh, in the Highlands? Snow peas, this is a... Uh, I've taken all of the cost of freight out of there. They haven't taken out the, the wastage. The snow peas, for instance, you could earn 58 kina, nearly 59 kina, in other words, close to $30 per kilogram if you could get snow peas from the Highlands to Port Moresby. You get rich very, very quick um, on... Uh, nearly $30 per kilogram for snow peas. And so it goes on. You can make money in vegetables in New Guinea if you can get it to market. So the findings. Very quickly, Bob needs, Port Moresby needs uh, both the central province and the highlands, the highlands and the lowlands. It needs a wholesale market. But the establishment of a wholesale market is high risk because it can actually force up the prices and it can be bypassed by retailers as they go direct and it can be resisted by Australian and New Zealand exporters who are actually quite influential in the marketplace. So the potential commercial funders are, are everywhere. There's the places are washed with money but the banks won't lend because it's in, in agriculture and consortia of commercial backers are unlikely to because they just don't want to collaborate together. The old money in Port Moresby won't, won't talk to other members of the old money club. It'll be an unattractive investment due to the high risk, slow start-up, long payback, low yield. We did a very quite sophisticated financial modelling of this, 12 scenarios uh, over 20 years, um, and uh, these are the things we found. Uh, commerce is very hesitant about uh, uh, public-private partnerships which was suggested at the beginning of the project. And the only people who would be interested in investing in these markets would be the landowner, landowner groups um, uh, who are earning royalties from the mining companies. So the options for market establishment, status quo, uh, morally I couldn't agree with the status quo. A new fresh ma market map, fresh wholesale fresh produce market now, too much risk. And so I, what I recommended was a staged, integrated uh, introduction of uh, an in infrastructure of an introduction of, of wholesale market with capacity building and infrastructure development. So I mean, I'll be very quick about this. Um, basically, I suggested that they should construct the upstream facilities to try and improve the cool chain concurrently to rejuvenate the, those terrible retail markets with all the extreme crime, initiate capacity building programs to do particularly with post-harvest training and so forth, but also fostering uh, regional wholesalers, most of whom are women, and plan and construct a wholesale market for about five years' time. And that was the model, and that'll do for the, for the uh, presentation. Any questions? Thanks, Laurie. <coughs> Sorry, it's a bit long. That's no, okay. Questions? Doug? Laurie, yeah, why is there so much crime in Papua New Guinea? Because people are so poor and they see haves and have nots. And it's not personal, it's not ideological, it's not religious, it's not racial. It's just simply that I have a mobile phone and a camera. And you don't. That's all it is. And the only reason that I'll chop you up on the way to getting your mobile phone is if you're too slow to get it out. So if you hesitate, you probably get a slap with a bush knife, which is a um, like a we'd call it a machete, but it's up to about that long. So you just slap with one of those and it'll take your arm off. So be quick about it when you give me your phone. Mm. Yeah, sorry, uh, I was a bit uh, moving a bit fast there. <coughs> wholesale markets around the world generally seem to have declined in their importance, except in a few places, uh, some in India where there's government intervention, regulations which encourage it, and in Vietnam 
and I don't know the details of why in Vietnam, but there seems to have been a development of a, a, a development, an evolution of wholesale markets into hubs, logistic hubs, which help to supply produce to supermarkets. And by adopting that function, they have been able to survive and grow. Whereas those wholesale markets that stayed strictly wholesale markets with small farmers coming in and big buyers coming in and buying from the small farmers, they tend to have declined. So it's the logistics hubs that have, that have evolved and have been successful. Yeah. Laurie, is, you know, is this just trying to fix a system that's broken? Like, a, like a, something that will be, you know, like, I, I sit here thinking what, what you need is a road from Port Moresby to the Highlands. Um, is there a transformational, are there some transformational options that are, and, and what's the politics of that and international yeah. aid? And there are countries, there are countries like Bangladesh where donor organisations have come in and gone, you need a road that doesn't flow, and then just gone, you know, boom, through the whole country. And that, I don't know how that was organised and I don't know how that was, yeah. you know, but we can talk about that soon. Okay. Um, yes, it was beyond the scope of this project because the New Zealand aid, um, people told me, the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade said that this project would set their agenda for the next five years if it was accepted by the stakeholders, which it was. So in other words, their budget, I think, was about 18 million New Zealand dollars a year, so not able to fix a road. Yeah. But the Chinese, whilst I was there doing this project, the Chinese, as they have done elsewhere around the world, they uh, apparently signed a contract to build the Highlands Highway. Um, and uh, actually a loop right out around the liquid natural, nat natural gas road and so there'd be a big loop around the country. Um, so yes, there's that. Uh, one of the other, there's a few very big uh, circuit breakers for New Guinea. One, another one would be the land tenure system it's currently um, controlled and dominated by customary land tenure and the banks won't lend against customary land tenure because there's no title. They, don't, they can't actually pin it down to somebody owning it because a whole tribe owns it. Um, they're trying to work their way through restructuring so that will improve but it's very slow. Corruption is a very big issue. And other things, infrastructural things like uh, a banking system. Banking system virtually doesn't exist outside of uh, the major towns and, uh, and the capital city. So basically half a dozen towns in, this, in the country have a banking system. To give you an idea, uh, I have um, a colleague or a friend in, in New Guinea who's with OSAID. Uh, he did, he's doing a PhD on the health system where the money disappears to in the health system and he's found that the district health people have to walk to um, several weeks to get to a population centre where they can get on a public motor vehicle and get to Port Moresby. There they have to live for four months with their relatives until they get their allocation for their health centre. Then they have to give a little bit to their relatives for rep, for uh, uh, board, for rented board, and then they have to get on a PMB and go home, and they pay all the various people along the way, and then they pay themselves for salary, and when they get to the end, there's no money left for help. All right, do you one, one quick more question, Neville, and then we better wrap up. Oh, just the, the obvious one, that the small holders that are further away from the transporter are never going to make it. Yeah. But the, the supermarkets <coughs> really want to deal with people who are reliable, so is it the best idea to foster the, the people who can do it well and make sure that that sort of supply is organised and then <coughs> gradually bring the others in? Yeah, which, which is what the other project with the Colin Birch and uh, Al Gracie and, and me and myself and Richard are working on, and that's looking at the central province around Port Moresby. This one was focusing a bit more, was including the highlands, which everybody tends to ignore. And how do we get the, the highlands into the picture and what, what influence will they have? Um, yeah, so uh, you're dead right. Focus close to home, but 
There are certain things that centre problems can't do, which is cool temperate vegetables, which is what the middle class and the white expats want in Port Norfolk. <coughs> but they are generally imported at this point, which is an outflow of of um, of uh, uh, money from the country rather than keeping it within the country. And hence my focus on including the Highlands in, in this project. 